Hey, Victory, wow, I am, uh, I'm so excited about the season that we're in of beginning to regather here back in the building. We actually have some of our staff here today. How exciting is this? Hey, I, I know some of you are even looking at the platform. You're like, hey, what's going on today? Um, I, I, I was thinking this last week about what I would say is the darkest place on earth that I've ever been. And I actually went there this last July that me and my family, we did the tourist thing, right? That we, uh, over the summer in July, we flew out to California and we rented the car and we drove through and we toured Yosemite National Park. And then we drove south of there and we ended up at this place called Sequoia National Park. And where it is, it's, it's the biggest trees on the planet that you're, I mean, they're, they're mammoth. Uh, uh, sort of trees. And we drove past them. We drove up this mountain and we saw the signs to go to this place called the Crystal Cave. And so we parked at the top of the mountain and me and my, my, my wife, Summer, and our two boys, we kind of journey down the path along the side of this mountain until we get to the, the mouth of this cave. And so the park ranger comes out and they take us along with probably about 15 other people into this cave. And I I just, I want you to understand, like we didn't go into the cave. Like we went deep (laughs) into the cave. We went deep, deep, deep twists, turns up, downs, tight spaces, back into the back of this gigantic cave. And it was there that if you've ever been in a tour, been in a place like this, is that tour guides do what tour guides do, the park rangers did. And what they did was they said, hey, everybody stay still. Hey, everybody, nobody move. And they reached over and they turned off the lights. And immediately we are enveloped by darkness. It is, it is a consuming darkness. If, you, if you've ever experienced this before, it's like your eyes are wide open, but it's just cold. Like you can't see anything. And instinctively, I just thought to myself, this is how I die, <laughs> right? Like, like, like the, the park ranger is gonna forget where the stupid light switch is. And then we're all gonna wander around in this cave for the next month until we starve to death. Um, and, and it's the strangest sensation that your eyes are wide open and I can feel it, I can hear it, but I can't see it. And you don't wanna move because it's a paralyzing darkness. I don't know if you've ever felt that before, like this paralyzing darkness. I actually thought about it like this. It is the loudest darkness that I've ever felt. And I promise you, while I'm there in the deepest darkness that I've ever been in, all I could think about was Genesis 1. And we know it, it says in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering on the waters. Like just imagine this, right? That the creation was created, but it was unlit. The creation was formed, but it was unseen. And it was there at that moment that God said, let there be light. And there was light. And a billion stars were born and galaxies were formed and supernovas began popping off that into chaos and disorder, God brought peace and God brought order because somehow in the story, now there was this sense that just a few minutes ago, it was hopeless, it was formed, but it was unseen, it was darkness, it was paralyzing. But now when light enters into the story, there's this sense that everything's gonna be okay. Right, everything's gonna, if if at least there's light, if at least I can see, everything's gonna be all right. And I want all of us to notice this, that the first thing that God ever spoke into existence was light. That the first thing, that the first words in the entire Bible that are dedicated to what God actually said was light. The first thing that God said was light. And the last thing we see in the Bible is light. That when death dies, right? Fast forward all the way to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation. When, 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 when you see at the very end, when death dies, right? And God recreates a new heavens and a new earth and a new city for his people. Revelation 21, 23 says this, that the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. That in the the heavenly city, that there is no more night. Why? Because God is there and God is light. 
Notice this, right? That the bookends of the Bible are about God killing darkness and bringing light. From Genesis to Revelation, God is ending darkness and God is bringing light. In fact, you could say the story of the Bible is one of moving from darkness to light. The story of the Bible is one of moving from darkness to light. In every single miraculous story, in every single fiery sermon from the mouth of a prophet, in every single um, uh, function of every single priest, in every single God-given tradition, in every single God-sparked festival, there is this movement from darkness to light. There's this calling out from where we were in the darkness to be in God's light. In fact, even the Old Testament prophets, they say that when the Messiah comes, when the Savior comes, he's gonna come and bring light. Isaiah 60 verse one says, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Isaiah 9 two says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And so this, this belief developed among the people that when the Messiah came, he would come and bring life. He would be a light bearer. He would be a truth carrier. He would be a wisdom bringer. He would be a demonic demolisher. He would be, be a death, um, death curer. He would be one who had healing in his hands and peace in his footsteps. He would be one who would bring light into the darkness. Their belief was this, that a great light from heaven would come into the deepest and darkest of places. And so when John, the disciple, when he begins his gospel, right? John 1, he retells Genesis with the revelation of the Messiah of Jesus Christ right at the center of the whole thing. John 1, verse 1, here it is. In the beginning, get that. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has ever been made and him was life. Get this, and that life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. I want us to understand this as, as we're getting going today. I want us to understand this is that there is no darkness so dark that the light of Jesus can't crush it. Come on, somebody. There is no darkness so dark that the light of Jesus, the darkness will never overcome him. And so Jesus begins his ministry and he begins going around from town to town and we catch up with him in John 7, all right? In John 7, he ended up in the temple in Jerusalem and, and probably late September, early October. And it was this time called the, the Festival of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. In, in, in Hebrew, it's Sukkot. That's what it is, Sukkot. Uh, um, and what it is, it's this festival that the Jews had. And in fact, they still have it. Uh, every single year today, like this year, they will have the, the Festival of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And what it is, is um, it's them remembering that God led them in the wilderness for 40 years, that they were a nomadic people, that they lived in tents. Why did they have to live in tents? Because they didn't know where they were going. And so they had to follow God wherever he went, they had to follow. Now, the question is this, how did God lead the people? How did God lead them? Exodus 13, 21. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. Get this, in a really dark world, God led the people by light. And so God called the Jews every single year to celebrate Sukkot. And for seven days, here's what they did. For seven days every year, um, they would remember God's faithfulness of how he led them in the wilderness with light. And so what they did, they actually, in the temple courts there, I mean, these giant temple courts, they actually built these giant four pillars of, of, of light. And on the top of them, there are these bowls of oil and, and, the, and, the, and the lamps. They actually, the, the old writings actually say this, is that the, the, the lamps there in the temple, they actually lit up the entire city of Jerusalem. It says there was no courtyard, no home that was devoid of light because the light was so bright coming out of the temple. Come on, somebody. I mean, that's, that's how bright this thing is. The, the lamps were so big that the, they actually said that the priests had to climb up ladders to refill the bowls of oil to keep the, the brightness, to keep the light going. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to remember that God led them for so long in the wilderness. And how did he lead them? He led them with light. 
And so they lit up the entire city for seven days. For seven days, everything was lit to remind them that God is a good leader. And what they did, what they did for those seven days, and again, they still do this today, many of them still do this today, is they would actually live in tents for seven days. They would set them up on the side of the streets in courtyards. Uh, they would set them up on rooftops as close to the temple as they could get. They would set up these, these tents. Why? To remind them they, that they were a nomadic people, right? They were a moving people. They, when God moved, they had to follow. And what happened was there was lots of singing and there was lots of dancing. And if we're going to be really honest, there was a lot of alcohol. Now, here's the thing. Maybe you can put two and two together. If you combine singing and dancing and alcohol and tents, somebody's going to get in trouble. <laughs> All right? Somebody's going to get in trouble. And it's right here in this context, in this surrounding Sukkot, in the, this, this festival, this joyous festival, that we find one of the most memorable stories in the entire Bible but maybe you've never placed it here before. John 8 says this, at dawn, he, Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Notice he is in the temple when he's doing this. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in him, to him a woman caught in adultery. You know, and here it, we always have to observe, obviously, <laughs> that they only bring the woman, right? Like they don't bring the man. Um, uh, if you're curious, it takes two to make a thing go right. And um, they didn't bring the dude and that was the society. And in fact, they're not even doing this out of pure motives. They're doing this to try and trap Jesus, but it's here and singing and dancing and celebrating with alcohol and tents that we find a woman caught in adultery. And now she's dragged before Jesus with a scarlet letter on her presented before Christ. And I said, what are you gonna do about this? And they made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? In fact, if you're curious, the law of Moses actually says to stone both the men and the women, but they're only focusing on the women. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Many people actually think he was writing the sins of all the accusers. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he rode on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. With a woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. He says, neither then do I accuse you, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. And it was there in the temple courts. Imagine the setting. It was there in the temple courts, tents, ever a rejoicing atmosphere surrounded by the four giant pillars that lit all of Jerusalem, reminding people of God's leadership in the desert, that Jesus surrounded by all the people. He's just liberated this woman. He's just brought this moment of light into the world. He says this, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I understand this, guys. A lot of us, we just cherry pick scriptures. A lot of us, we've never understood why in the world did Jesus say, I am the light of the world. But when you actually understand that the totality of scripture is a journey from darkness into light, it comes as no surprise that the light of heaven comes into the cave of the world to shine. And he comes to bring God's truth and God's love and God's grace and God's mercy and God's righteousness into the darkness, into the cave of humanity and into the people walking in a great darkness. The light, is, the light has come and the light has come to shine. Now get this, guys. And this is kind of the theme that we're in in this series. Whenever, whenever God says anything, you should listen. <laughs> But whenever God says, I am, fill in the blank, stop your life, turn everything else off and pay attention because what he's about to say 
can revolutionize your life. And the good news is this, to those of us living in the land of a deep darkness, the light has come and the light's name is Jesus Christ. So we no longer have to walk in, walk in the darkness any longer. And so the question is this, this light of the world, who is he? Who is he? Here's the first thought. Jesus is the light ahead of us. Jesus is the light ahead of us. Jesus says that he, get the context again, is that Jesus says he's the light of the world to a people who are living in tents. And why did God have them to live in tents? Because they needed to remember, because we're all prone to forget that God is a good leader. Get this, right? Is that God, what he was trying to do, he was trying to remind them, yes, I, you have arrived in the promised land, but you haven't arrived. I'm gonna say that again. What he's telling them is, you may have arrived in the promised land, but you haven't arrived. And even though your bodies are stationary, your hearts need to be nomadic because, because God is still leading with a cloud by day. God is still leading with a fire by night. That God is still a good leader. God is still leading us forward. And whenever he leads, we have to be willing to follow, right? Anywhere in the desert over those 40 years, right? That, that, they, were, that they were nomadic. Anywhere in the desert, they could have set up shop. They could have built homes. They could have settled down. But God wouldn't let them because God was still leading them. And they had to learn how to trust God's leadership even when it didn't make sense. Even when they're like, we could settle there. He's like, no, no, I got a better place for you. You got to keep following me. And what he's saying is this. I believe that this is what God is saying is this. He's saying your bodies may live in homes, but your hearts need to live in tents because I'm still a God who leads with a cloud by day and a fire by night, I invite you to continue following me for the rest of your life. I believe that that's the message of Sukkot. I believe that that's the message of today. When Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, he's saying, guys, I know we all live in homes. I know many of us were settled down, but he said, don't ever let your heart settle down. You have to be willing to follow me by the light wherever I lead. And it's just like my family, right? <laughs> my family, that when we were in the cave, Thank God the park ranger actually remembered where the light switch was and, and she turned the light back on. If not, you'd be like, wasn't there this one guy like who used to be here sometimes and he would preach, right? Like, no, thank God we, we found our way back. But when, when she flipped the light switch on, we couldn't see everything, but we could see enough. Come on, listen to what I'm saying. We didn't have to wander in the darkness anymore because we had a good leader. Think of it like this, Psalm 119, 105. We say that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What God is trying to say here is, guys, I'm gonna lead you, but you're gonna have to trust me because my word, the way I'm gonna lead you is not a floodlight to your future. It's a flashlight for your feet. And, and, and I'm not gonna give you a map, but I am gonna give you me. And so every single day, what you're gonna have to do is you're just gonna have to follow me. And some days are gonna be nice and some days are gonna be easy and some days are gonna be calm, but there's gonna be other days when the cloud begins to move, when the fire begins to move, when the light begins to move, when I begin calling you back into a nomadic way of living and thinking and moving and breathing. And in that time, you have to follow me. You have to follow me that Jesus is the light ahead of us, leading us forward. And guys, you better believe this. You better believe in a church, in a leadership during this season here at Victory, we're having to do this, right? Like we're, we're, we're having to trust God's leadership about how to regather back in our buildings across all of our campuses. We're, we're having to trust God's leadership about how to engage the community around us. We're having to trust God's leadership to, to, um, to engage in really difficult staff decisions we're having to make. We're having to trust God's leadership on how to engage the racial divide that we see in the world around us. We're having to trust God's leadership and how to go through this amazing but, but, but difficult because there's so many moving pieces of the transition, the succession that we're going through right now. You better believe that we're having to trust God's leadership. Listen, if we were trying to do this in our own human wisdom, we'd be like blind people groping in darkness. But we have a light ahead of us that when he moves, we move. And when he goes, we go. And when he stays, we stay. And when he speaks, we speak. And that same God wants to lead you. The same God wants to lead you. And listen, there are so many voices and there's so many forces and there's so many people in speaking and trying to lead right now in the world around us. And the problem is this, guys, 99% of them aren't godly. Come on, 
99% of, of what's happening in the world right now is trying to lead us in the wrong direction. And here's the problem. I see Christians, right, like sharing in the hate. I see Christians sharing in the mess. I see Christians sharing in the anger and the condemnation and the shaming that the rest of the world is. They're getting into the fray. Christians getting bitter and offended. Christians attacking other Christians. I see Christians getting into the politics and the sin and the garbage. I see Christians overcome by anxiety and fear and worry. And it's to this, I love this quote, Corey Ten Boom. She says this, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest because we have a good leader. And if we keep our eyes on him, listen, I know it's a hot mess right now in the world around us. But if we keep our eyes on Christ, the storm may be around us, but the storm doesn't have to be in us and our hearts can actually be at rest. And what I'm asking, I believe what the Lord is asking us to do is to follow the right leader. Because there's a lot of people, anti-God people who are trying to lead right now. And the people of God are being led like lambs to the slaughter. But God is saying, hey, I'm the light ahead of you. Keep your eyes on me. He's the North Star. I mean, is it, come on guys, isn't it so interesting that the old saying is, right, when somebody gets saved that they've seen the light, right? Because what it is, is now my eyes have been opened up. I'm not just following blindly like everybody else says. No, I actually have a leader now. I see everything different now. I've seen the light. My eyes are open. The world used to be formed, but dark. Now the world is formed and visible. I can see it for what it is. Why? Because the light of Christ is shining on it and he's leading me forward. But I have to follow him. Here's the thing, guys. To those living in the land of darkness, the light has shown. But we can't just talk about the light and we can't just look at the light. We actually have to follow the light. And, and, and I'm hearing the voice of the Lord today. As Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He's saying, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. And I'm the light ahead of you. I'm the light ahead of you. Here's the, here's, the, here's the second thing, is that Jesus is the light ahead of us and Jesus is the light within us. Jesus is the light within us. Um, you guys know this. One of society's favorite things to say is he who is without sin cast the first stone, right? People who have never read the Bible say that, right? People are like, I, I don't even know what a Bible is. I've heard of a Bible, but man, don't judge. Don't, be the, don't cast the first stone, right? And they don't even understand that the same Jesus who said he who is without sin cast the first stone. In his next breath, he looks at this woman and he says, go and leave your life of sin, right? Come on. He doesn't just say, hey, everybody, don't cast the first stone. No, he's saying, then he turns around. And he says, hey, what you were doing was wicked. Leave it. And, and the same Jesus who engages this woman caught in darkness is the same Jesus who speaks to her darkness and calls her out of it, right? Because this is God's desire is to take broken, sinful people and to allow the light of Christ, not just to shine around them, but to shine in them, to shine in them, right? The, the, uh, John 8, 12, I'm gonna read it again. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Greek right there, the, the Greek is actually a double negative. It says, whoever follows me will never, no, never walk in darkness. Uh, the Aramaic, the original language is, uh, it actually says, whoever follows me will never be pushed by darkness ever again. I love that. That whoever follows me, that darkness will no longer bully you any longer in your life. Sin is no longer your master. Demons no longer have control over your life. That when the light of Christ comes on the inside of you, darkness can't bully you. Demons can't push you. Satan no longer owns you. And you will never, no, never walk in darkness. And that's the promise. That's the promise. He says, if you will follow me, then you'll never walk in darkness. Again, Paul says it a different way. Second Corinthians 4, 6. He says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, right? Genesis 1. He made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. <laughs> I love that. That when we say yes to Jesus, the light of Christ floods our life and it exposes all those hidden things. Come on, y'all remember like when you first got saved, this is what repentance is. 
This is like when the light of Christ shines on the dark places and it exposes it. It exposes the fears and the failures and the addictions and the pride and the broken relationships and the greed and the idolatry and the immorality, the sexual stuff, the, the, the wickedness, the hatred. He exposes all of it. And there's this moment of breaking where you're like, yes, I know I may have sinned against a lot of people, but like, like the, the scriptures say, God against you and you alone have I sinned. Right, Because now the light of God, the pure, unadulterated, blinding light of God, the purity of God has come into dark places on the inside. It exposes it. And what we're saying is, God, I'm not sorry I got caught. God, I'm sorry that I sinned against the living God. And so I wanna make this clear, John, John 8, 12, he says, you know, the, the, I'm the light of the world and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. What Jesus is really saying is this, I wanna make this really clear. I wanna put it up here on the screen. You need to write it down because this needs to strike your soul. Jesus makes darkness a choice. Jesus makes darkness a choice. That when you're outside of faith in Christ, come on guys, when you are outside of faith in Christ, you were blind you're in a deep, dark cave and it's a screaming darkness. All you have is seven step programs and self-control. All you have is just trying to scrounge up your, your smile for the day. But when Christ comes into your life, you now have power together with the Holy Spirit to no longer walk in darkness. You don't, you, when the light of Christ comes on the inside of us, now darkness becomes a choice. You don't have to walk in darkness unless you want to unless you want to, because the burning, fiery eyes of Jesus Christ, remember that revelation, the fiery eyes of Jesus wanna illuminate and they wanna root out and they wanna burn away anything wicked in us that's trying to steal and kill and destroy our life. And he does it with kindness. It's always his kindness that leads us to repentance because I know some of us were afraid of what he's gonna do. I promise you, we have a very kind God. And he doesn't do it all at once. It's kind of like a bonfire, right? Come on, think about it. It's kind of like a bonfire. The closer you get to it, the more it illuminates you, the more you can see the details of yourself. And the closer you get to Christ, the more he'll show you, the more he'll illuminate, the more that light will shine within you and reveal what's going on. And you don't have to walk in darkness unless you choose to. And it, it breaks God's heart. It breaks my heart, it breaks our heart. Whenever we see people who have lived in darkness for years and they've tried to deceive everybody else, they've even tried to deceive themselves, but not even one of us is able to deceive the Lord because the Lord sees what's done in the darkness and the light of Christ wants to expose everything on the inside of us so that the enemy can stop stealing and killing and destroying our past, our present and our future. And today is the day, I feel it, today is the day to pull back the curtain. Come on, pull back the curtain. Some of you even need to say, God, I wanna pull back the curtain. And I wanna let the light of Christ shine on the inside of me and expose and reveal things that I've been hiding from or maybe I didn't even know was there. Um, this, last, this last week I was reading an op-ed article and um, I'm gonna give you a quote from somebody that you did not think you would get a quote from today, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And here's what he said. I thought this was so good. He's talking about what's happening in the world around us. He says, racism in America is like dust in the air. It seems invisible, even if you're choking on it until you let the sun in. Then you can see that it's everywhere. And as long as we keep shining that light, we have a chance of cleaning it wherever it lands. Man, that's good. And I feel like what God is saying today is pull the curtains back. As long as you keep letting Jesus shine the light, as long as you don't choose to cover up and hide and live in darkness, then you don't have to walk in darkness. God is saying, pull back the curtains, let the light of Christ in. And so with the, when the light exposes what's hidden in the air, what's hidden in the heart of our lives, then we can clean it wherever it lands. And I know sometimes that, that, that idea is scary, it's intimidating, but we have to make the decision today, God, I'm no longer gonna allow the enemy to rob me of my future. Because I don't just have a light ahead of me, I have a light within me that wants to reveal and expose and heal. 
In Psalm, Psalm 139, maybe this is a great day to pray this, verse 23. Search me, God. Know my heart. Pull the curtain back. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because I can't just look at the light. I have to follow the light. And I can't just follow the light. I have to allow that light to then illuminate within me to make me more like him, to be holy as he is holy. And that's the best way to live because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Here's the last thought, okay? Is that Jesus is the light ahead of me. Jesus is the light within me. And Jesus is the light through me. Jesus is the light through me. Um, when, if you watched our service last week, uh, Pastor Dennis said something at the very end. It was like his last statement that I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. He said that we should not be an echo, we should be a voice. He said, too many of us are being an echo when we're actually called to be a voice. And I was sitting there, I was like, I can't say amen loud enough to that. That the idea is this, is that God doesn't just want us to lead. He doesn't want to just lead us with his light. He doesn't want to just fill us with his light. He actually wants to shine through us to lead others with his light. And that's the idea of Matthew 5, a very familiar verse for many of us. Verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. This is Jesus. This is red letters. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father and heaven. And I wanna say this, I wanna make this really clear because I feel like God is saying this in this season is that God is calling us to lead, to share our light, not just to click share on social media. Come on, I'm gonna say it again. God is calling us to lead, not just to click share. Unless you're sharing things that are leading people closer to Christ. Listen, the, the easiest thing, the easiest thing in the world is to say, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. Hey everybody, there's a problem. There's a problem, there's a problem, that's broken, that's broken, that's broken, that's broken, that's broken. There's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. The easiest thing in the world is to point out problems. The question is, what are we doing about it? Because the people of Christ is the family of God. We aren't just called to, to, to expose problems. We're then called to step into it with the kingdom. We're called to actually do something about it. How are we being and bringing light into dark places? Yes, part of it is exposing it. But listen, if all we're doing is just sharing what everybody else in the world is sharing, we're just sharing and we're participating in the toxicity. And what we're doing, we're not sharing the gospel, we're sharing the grave. We're not, we're not sharing life, we're sharing death. We're not, we're not letting our light shine, we're covering our light up. And what God is calling us to do, he's saying, let our light shine. Why? So that others would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. And so the question in this, and I know coronavirus adds this really weird layer on top of this thing, okay? Because the, 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 the distancing part of this, but I'm just saying this, how many people in your neighborhood see you? How many people on social media hear you? How many people in your workplace feel you? And they say, glorify their God. <laughs> wow, that guy looks like Jesus. That, that woman looks like Jesus. That student looks like Christ. How many, how, how many people see our light shining and glorify our Father in heaven? Could it be that we're more participating in the voice of the world than we are the voice of the word to bring light into dark places? Because God doesn't just wanna lead us forward. God doesn't wanna just fill us within. He also wants to let that light shine through us to bring darkness wherever, I mean, to bring dark, uh, light into the darkness wherever we go. And, and I'd say this, guys, I'd say this. If you are uncomfortable right now, Good, good. If, if, God is actually, if God is actually starting to say, hey, you've been covering your light up and you've been saying, all right, God, if I need to make that post on social media, if I actually need to have an original thought, if I actually need to quote a scripture to people who don't even know I'm a Christian, if you're starting to get uncomfortable right now, you are in the best place ever. If God is starting to say, hey, some of you, you need to get in your car and you need to drive somewhere to talk to somebody. If you need to talk to somebody about Christ, if you need to get out of the boat, you're in the best place possible. This last week, we had one of the friends of the house, Chip Judd, Pastor uh, Chip Judd, come in and, and, and speak to us. And he said this, it was so good. He said, always be suspicious of comfort. Always be suspicious of comfort because comfort is a narcotic Comfort lulls us to sleep. Comfort says, hey, just stay in the boat. Don't rock the boat. Comfort says, just say what everybody else is saying so you'll be accepted. 
Comfort says, hey, remember that one time you shared something that you knew was right, that God was saying to do, but then everybody dogpiled you, so you deleted it. God is saying, hey, it's time to enter back in and to be light in the darkness. And everything inside you screaming, just calm down, just be still, just, just, just don't rock the boat. But you have to have a heart today that says, nah, man, I'm nomadic because I have a nomadic God and he has not called us to be stationary and he never called us to be comfortable. He called us to have a heart that wants to follow him, to let that light shine in us and then to let that light shine through us out into the world. Micah 6, 8, what does God require of us? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's who God is looking for in this time, to to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I'm just gonna say this for too long, guys. We have abdicated the most important strategic roles in society, in politics, in the church, in our workplace, and yes, even in protest. We have abdicated our roles in these spaces. And so in the vacuum of the church abdicating our roles, other people have filled these spaces and they filled them with anti-Christ, anti-God sort of voices and sort of agendas. And it is time for the people of God to be a city on a hill once again that cannot be hidden because we have the light of the world in us and it's screaming to shine. It's screaming to shine. And to everybody, I know some of you out there, ultra conservative, whatever it is, are like, man, stick to the gospel. Just preach the gospel and everything will be okay. Listen, we don't just preach the gospel to abortion. We get out there and we work to end it. Come on, somebody. We don't just preach the gospel about sex trafficking. We set our hands to the plow and we get out there to end it. We don't just preach the gospel about racism. We also have to get out there and we have to work to end it. We don't just preach the gospel to our neighbors. We then have to go and love our neighbors. It's time to let the light of Christ not just be ahead of us, not just to be privately in us, to be a nice citizen, but then to turn and to let it shine. To let it shine because we live in a dark world that is grasping that the darkness is screaming and people don't know their left from the right. And they're desperately in need of the people of God to rise and shine so they would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. And so what it's gonna take is, we're gonna have to get outside of our comfort zone. We're gonna have to be willing to rock the boat. We're gonna have to get creative and we're gonna have to start following God that when he moves, when the light moves, when he says to speak, when he says, hey, here's an idea post this, says, hey, here's a good job opportunity, move there. That we say, God, I don't understand it, but it's undeniably your leadership. And so I follow it. And so what Jesus invites us today is this. He invites us to follow him through the twists and the turns of life as the light ahead of us. He invites us to pull back the curtains on the inside of us and to let the light of Christ shine within us. And then he, he invites us to allow that light to shine through us out into a really dark world full of blind people who need light. If not us, who? And if not now, when? It's time to let our light shine because he's the light of the world. He's the light of the world. And we cannot hide him any longer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's bow our heads. Let's pray, everybody. God, I thank you that you did so love the world that you gave us your son. And even to us, a people who live in a land of the deepest darkness, the light of God has come. And Jesus is the light of the world. And we don't have to walk in darkness any longer. God, we've seen the light and we wanna walk in the light as you were in the light. We wanna be about kingdom business. We wanna be nomadic. God, bigger than our our comfort being unsettled, God, we, we should be unsettled by the things that we see in the world around us to be provoked to action because the people of God are not a comfort-based, silent, (laughs) passive people. We have an active kingdom and a cloud that moves by day and a fire that moves by night. And so God, today, 
we say that we will follow and we will pull the curtains back and allow that light around us to enter into us. And then we will let our light shine. We won't keep it to ourselves any longer. So here's what I wanna do. If we can just put um, this next slide up. This is kind of these, these questions right here. I just, over the next few minutes, um, I just want you to kind of be asking these questions about you know, the, the leadership of the light around us. Where have we not really been following God's leadership? Where do we need to pull the curtains back of our lives and let God's light to shine in us? And where do we need to then turn and to let our light shine? And so if you say today, I'm a follower of Christ, I wanna just invite you. If you're, you, you say, I've known Christ for a long time, or man, this is, this is a season where, where I need the light of Christ to shine on me. I just wanna invite you just for the next few minutes to pray through those three things. And while you do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to another group today. Some of you today are saying, man, I, I don't know Jesus. Um, maybe you just kind of clicked on this on Facebook. Somebody got it, sent you a link and you're on our website. I, I don't know how you got this, but um, God loves you enough that you would find an intersection point here today where your life intersected this message. And maybe you're feeling the light begin to shine. Where you're like, man, I've, I've never felt guilty about that sin before. I've never, I've never felt drawn to Jesus in this way. That's the kindness of God. Scripture really does say that. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And that word repentance literally means to turn. It's saying, God, I was going that way, but I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna follow you now. I'm not gonna follow what I wanna do. I'm gonna now follow you because you're a good leader. <laughs> you're the best leader. And what I want to do, I wanna invite you into this, this moment of prayer, okay? And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I'll, 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 I'll start and then you can kind of echo what I say, but don't, don't just give it lip service. Say, if, if I actually wanna let the light of God shine on the inside of me, um, I want you to pray with me, okay? Let's pray together. Say it like this, say, Jesus, thank you that you love me so much that you came to this dark world to shine and you lived the perfect life and you died the perfect death on the cross for my sins. I receive that today. I receive the forgiveness of my sins that I am free and I am clean and you smile when you think about me. <laughs> That's how clean I am now. And so I turn from my past, I repent of my ways, and I say today, I'm gonna go your way for the rest of my life. I give you my past, my present, and my future. You are my Lord, and you are my Savior. Come right now and let the light of Jesus fill my heart, fill my life. Go and just spend a second right there. That light is not just a revealing thing, it's also a loving thing, that God loves us so much that he meets us exactly right where we are, but he also loves us enough to not let us stay right there. He's calling us forward, he's calling us forward deeper to, into a love relationship with him, he's calling us deeper into a, a life of following him and he's calling us deeper and now into a life of purpose where we can let our light shine, where we can actually not just kind of ho-hum our nine to five and just wake up and go to sleep just night after night, day after day, day after day. But now we actually have a reason to live and that's to let the light of Christ shine through us so that others would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. God, I thank you for the light of heaven that has come into this dark world. Let your light continue to shine ahead of us, within us, and through us, so that all would know that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. In Jesus' name, amen.